بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The last week uh, we concluded by mentioning a unique style in the Arabic language. A unique style in the Arabic language, especially in the Quran, and that is when you want to go easy on someone, when you want to go soft on someone, when you want to have mercy towards someone you want to reprimand and you want to criticize, uh, you use the third person, right? This is Abasa wa Tawalla. He frowned and he turned away. So there's not a second person mentioned. And this, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reprimanding his messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, he uses third person, that's an indication or that implies that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being merciful with his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so he's going easy on him. So he says, abasa wa tawalla, as opposed to saying, abasta wa tawallayt. This is something we learn. This comes many times in the Quran, but for what we're talking about now in Surah Abasa, this is the case. Now, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we discussed last week the, the background information as to this verse and why does it come. And we said that this is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam having found a golden opportunity first time in his Meccan Da'wah to give Da'wah to the uh, elite and the prestige of Quraysh. And now for the first time they're actually listening and we'll get to know what their intention was. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose them as well. But for now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is listening to them and he is giving them da'wah and they're listening as well. And all of a sudden, one of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is known as Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum, who was a blind man, one of the earliest to come into Islam, walks towards Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he screams out, Ya Muhammad, Alimni mimma allamak Allah. And we said that he didn't uh, disrespect Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by saying, Ya Muhammad, rather this is Meccan da'wah and the, the companions and the Muslims at that time haven't been cultured yet. So they haven't been taught how to call on to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So there's no blame on him for that. So this is what happens. He starts saying, Ya Muhammad, Alimni mimma allamak Allah. Oh Muhammad, teach me from what Allah has taught you. And so Rasulullah looks at him and he frowns. And we said this frowning, uh, just like a, a very light frown, very small frown. And this is the least, the least form of uh, disappointment or upset you could have on your face, as opposed to the other words that are used in the Quran. And he turns away. He looks at him, he frowns, and he turns away. Now, why, did, why does he frown and why does he turn away? The second verse in the surah comes to explain to us. An al-a'ma. And this an in the Arabic language is referred or known as an al-masdariya. That means that the next verse is verse an al-a'ma becomes the maf'ul li ajlihi, maf'ul lahu. Basically, another word for it, which means the reason. And Ja'awul Arma is going to give us in this verse there is the reason for why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam frowned and he turned away. And what was this reason? Allah says, An Ja'awul Arma. It is because there came to him the blind man. An Ja'awul. And remember last time I shared with you at the end of Surah Al Nazi'at. فَإِذَا جَاءَتِ الطَّامَّةُ الْكُبْرَةِ And we said جَاءَتْ to, to come And there are two words in the Arabic language that mean to come أتى and جاء أتى and جاء both mean to come But we said أتى Well we said sorry جاء is a more heavier and a stronger word in comparison to أتى So when the word جاء comes means something heavy, something big has come so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says about the day of judgment coming, he uses the word ja, 
meaning just made a grand arrival, a very big event that has come. So now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Anja'ahu al-A'ma, we already take from this the idea of that Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, he didn't just casually come, it wasn't a soft coming, he jaa'ed. He came with, with a lot of enthusiasm. You know, he came rushing to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ready to learn from what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has been given of knowledge. So he's, he's in there. He's coming to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa was something grand for him, something that he honored. So he, ra he rushed towards Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <coughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he referred to Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum with that very same defect he has in him, and that is that he is blind. Now there's something here that's perhaps you'll think it's contradictory in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, he teaches us and he forbids us that we call one another in nicknames we don't like, or to give one another names in which we don't like. So this man doesn't He's not, he doesn't like to be known as short bloke. So we're not allowed to call him short bloke. This is haram in Islam. Allah says in Surah Al-Hujurat, وَلَا تَنَابَزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ Don't give each other nicknames. So now, we're sure that a blind man, he doesn't like to be referred to as blind. Hey, blind. You know, that's not something, that's that's Al-Alqab, that's Al-Tanabuz Bil-Alqab. So how does Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala do this here? Now you've got to make a difference. If you're going to refer to this person in, in, like in the defect he's got, in something he doesn't like, and, you, and this is a way you're going to praise him, then that's alright. Or to differentiate between him and someone else, then that's alright as well. So for example, you have two short blokes. So you want to refer to one of them is blind, the other is not. You'll say the short, the blind one. Just to make a difference between both of them. And this is used a lot in the hadith where the people of hadith used to refer to one another. Uh, just so they can differentiate between each other in the hadith. Uh, who narrated the hadith and so on. So now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum as the blind man, the blind, he actually, he's praising him when he says this. The first thing is that he gives him excuse. It is an excuse for him and for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How? It's an excuse for the messenger. Now that we understand he's blind, oh, we understand what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did of frowning and turning away. He's not harmed by it because he's blind. He doesn't see it. So he comes as an excuse for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it also comes as an excuse for Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. How? Because he's blind. Had he seen Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam engaged in conversation with Quraysh, he wouldn't have approached. But because he's blind, he didn't see. Now he doesn't know what Rasulullah is doing. He quickly rushed and he got into the midst, into the situation of where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. Again, this is also like a compliment and a praise for him. How? Although he is blind, he's sightful. He sees the truth. And Quraysh, the ones that are literally, they're sightful, they can see, they're not blind, but they're actually blind. They can't even see the truth. They're blinded away from the haq, from the truth. Whereas this blind man, he's more sightful than anyone else in that area there. In, in the perspective, in terms that he sees the truth. So he rushes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because of his fee, as it comes later on, uh, more apparent. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّ What would give you any clue? Now notice the transition. It is changed from third person to second person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now is addressing his messenger. He's saying, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ That kaf here is the second person. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is getting closer to his messenger alayhi salatu wasalam to teach him this awesome lesson. He says, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ 
What gives you any clue? What gives you any clue that perhaps Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum, he might have purified himself? Had you given him a bit of attention? And the word you drink is a very interesting word in the Arabic language. It comes from Daryun, Dal, Ra, Ya, which means to know something. And Yudrik means what tool do you have in your disposal or at your disposal to know such information, to know the intention of this man? What do you know of his intention? Did he come to purify himself or he didn't come to purify himself? And uh, basically what the verse is saying is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling his messenger alayhi salatu wa salam, you don't have any tool. You do not have any tool at your disposal whatsoever to know why or with what intention Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum came to you. And this ayah comes in the defense of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than it's a criticism. Allah is telling him, you have no idea what his intention was. Had Rasulullah knew his intention, perhaps the situation would have been different. Perhaps the outcome would have been different. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given his messenger alayhi salatu was salam the permission, the license to judge someone's inside. He alayhi salatu was salam can't even judge what's inside of a person. So how does one of us try to judge others? You know, this is Rasulullah, the most closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he doesn't have this tool. And this surah has a similar theme to the surah previous to it, which is Surah Al-Nazi'at, right? In Surah Al-Nazi'at, we found that Musa alayhi salam, he went to who? To Fir'aun. And just by looking at Fir'aun, just by studying his history, we know this man is corrupt, right? He's killing, he's killing babies every second year. And he oppresses Bani Israel, he enslaves them, he crucifies them, you know, chops their arms from left and right. Their left, their, if, their chop, if he chops their right arm, he'll chop their left leg, and so on. That, that's his torture towards them. And he calls himself God. So just by listening and knowing who this guy is, you already pass a judgment and say he's corrupt. But look at this profound lesson we learn in that surah. When Musa alayhi salam goes to Fir'aun, does he judge? Does he, is he quick to pass this judgment? No. He says, Hallaka ila antazakka. He doesn't even say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there's no use. This man is corrupt. Everyone knows of his corruption. Forget it. No. He goes and he says to him, what does he say to him? Do you have any inclination to bring this good that's within you out? So he doesn't even deny that there's good in him. He acknowledges there's good. Obviously there's good in everyone and that's the fitrah Allah created us with. But he tells him, do you have any, any inclination, any desire whatsoever to bring out this goodness from you and become a good, a pers good person, become a purified man? So even Musa السلام, at that time wasn't quick to pass a judgment. Maybe there is good. Maybe this good will come out. What do you know? Just give the da'wah and let that da'wah do the work. Let this Qur'an that comes out of your mouth do the work. Let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the one that judges. Then, so, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to his messenger here, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّ You had no means at your disposal whatsoever to know what intention Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum came to you with. Perhaps he came in the intention of purifying himself. وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّ means perhaps he came in the intention of purifying himself. And yazakka, as we shared with you the other time, it means to cleanse yourself, cleanse oneself, purify oneself. So you'll find uh, the filthy habits, the filthy habits that you're on, and you'll focus on them, and you'll try to cleanse them. 
That's the process of tazkiyah. When you find the faults, the flaws that are within you, in your manners, in your characteristics, and you find these manners and you try to fix them, try to make them better, that's the tazkiyah. That was the role of the prophets and the messengers. So, subhanAllah, also we learn a lesson in this ayah. What is this? We learn that the aim of gaining knowledge, the aim of seeking knowledge, is not to just increase your, your, your ilm, to increase your knowledge, or to learn about information, interesting facts, interesting information, dates and times and places, timelines and so on. Rather, the intention of learning is to purify yourself. This is the intention. Because Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum, he's rushing to learn, right? Alimni, teach me. And Allah is saying the intention was that he purifies himself. So we learn, we learn a great lesson in this ayah, and that is when you gain knowledge, the only purpose of this is how is this knowledge you just learned going to make you a better person? How is it going to purify yourself? How are you going to purify yourself with it? And how are you going to become a better person, a better person in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? One more thing in this ayah that's nice and very eloquent is Allah says, لَعَلَّهُ yazakka." Now this word yazakka, which means to purify himself, this is the shortened, the shortened version. The lengthened version would be yatazakka. So what's actually happened in this word, there has been a, a fusion of two letters. Two letters have been merged together. And that is the ta and the za. So originally this word is yatazakka. Yatazakka. But we say yazakka, put that shadda on the ta, on the za. It means you put the ta in the za. And now it becomes yazakka. And last time I shared with you, and let me just recap now, when the two letters in the one word are merged, it refers to partial meaning. And when the word is lengthened, so the letters are not merged, it refers to its full meaning. So let's imply this to the ayah here. It'll mean, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّ What will give you any clue, Ya Rasulullah, that perhaps Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum would have received some purification. Some purification. Now why is it important to say some? We're learning another great lesson here. That purification, purification doesn't come in one sitting. Doesn't come in one sitting. So Allah doesn't say لَعَلَّهُ يَتَزَكَّ Because يَتَزَكَّ would have meant that just by this one advice he would have purified him also, everything. Everything would have been perfect. But we don't learn this. Allah says لَعَلَّهُ يَتَزَكَّ Perhaps he would have received some purification. And it's very important as we said that we learn now, we understand that purification and learning Islam, learning Deen, doesn't happen in one sitting. Doesn't happen in one place. This is something continuous. You gotta keep all your life. All your life your aim is to tazakka, to become a better person. It's not a matter of sitting here today and we've become better people. No. Look at the Sahaba. And look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 23 years of da'wah. 23 years until at the end Islam became perfect. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it a religion that he was pleased with and he made it for the people then. Islam 23 years and companions sitting with Rasulullah all this duration, all this period. Then finally the tazkiyah comes about. So this is a profound lesson just by this step. We learn that the tazkiyah, purification, comes in more than one sitting, not in one sitting. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh, we have Oh, and this oh, and maybe. So this is also a continuation of the ayah before. What would give you any clue? 
What type of tool do you have at your disposal that perhaps you could have reminded him, oh, yeah, dhakka, he would have had taken the reminder, he would have had gotten the reminder from you. Then he would have been benefited by this reminder. He would have been benefited by this reminder. Now, there are two words that could have been, there is another word that could have been used here. And that is, فَتَنْفَعَهُ التَّذْكِيرِ that, that also could have been possible. But Allah, He chose in this ayah, الذِّكْرَ Now what does this, what's the difference between التَّذْكِيرِ and ذِكْرَ تَذْكِيرِ is a reminder. الذِّكْرَ This is the emphasized version. So how would we translate this? We'd say a powerful reminder. فَتَنْفَعَهُ الذِّكْرَ that this reminder you would have spoken to him, he would have maybe benefited from this powerful reminder. And what a dhikrah here, what it's illustrating is that whenever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke to someone, whenever he opened his mouth and words came out, then this in itself wasn't just a reminder, it was a powerful reminder. It was an enormous reminder. And if he had just addressed him, Allah is saying, if he just had addressed him, spoken to him something little, it would have been so powerful for him. So powerful of a reminder for him. Allahu A'lam, what its effects would have been. So now the Prophet, والسلام, his role is to address the people, to warn the people. And especially, Especially now that he's in Mecca, as he's reciting Quran, who's the main audience? Who's listening? Besides the believers, Quraysh, the pagan Arabs, the disbelievers. And this, when, when it's mentioned, it is referring, what's the powerful reminder? What's the most powerful reminder? It's referring to the Quran. It is referring to the Quran when it comes to talking about a dhikra to the disbelievers, to Quraysh. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and just one thing before we move on, you'll find in the Qur'an, this word, yudrik, comes in the present tense and in the past tense. So you have adrak and yudrik. Yudrik is used twice in the Qur'an, three times in the Qur'an. Three times. Every time the word yudrik comes, which is in the present tense, then... The Prophet والسلام, will not know. He'll never know. Not now, until Yawm al Qiyam. So, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّ He doesn't know what the intention of Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum was. And he'll never know. And it comes again in Surah Al Ahzab and in Surah Al Shura. In Surah Al Ahzab, Allah says, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّ السَّاعَةَ تَكُونُ قَرِيبًا and in Surah Al-Shura he says, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّ السَّاعَةَ قَرِيبًا Or قَرِيب, sorry, without the alif. Again, when he spoke about the hour, he used the word yudrik, the present tense, and that already means you don't know and you'll never know in the future, up until its time comes. But when the word adrak comes, which is in the past tense, Allah tells him in the Qur'an what it is. وَالسَّمَاءِ وَالطَّارِقِ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الطَّارِقِ What is this طَارِقِ? The answer comes straight after. النَّجْمُ الثَّاقِبِ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا هِيَ What is it? Then Allah mentions هِيَ نَارٌ حَامِيَةٌ نَارٌ حَامِيَةٌ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ What will give you any clue as to what Laylat Al-Qadr is? Allah gives him a clue. خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٍ And so on. الْحَاقَةُ مَا الْحَاقَةُ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْحَاقَ what gives you any clue what al-haqqa is? Then Allah answers. He gives him a clue. Yawma. Al-haqqatu wa ma adraka wa al-haqqa kathabat thamud wa aadun bin qari'a. This is al-haqqa. So always adrak in the past, he'll have information and he'll have knowledge about it. Allah will teach him. But yudrik in the present, he won't know now, he won't know in the future. And this comes only for the hour and for the intention. So this is something great we learn. That the intention, even here, alayhi salatu wasalam, doesn't know now. Allah won't tell him now, 
and he doesn't know in the future the intentions of the people. Then Allah says, أَوْ يَذَّكَّرُ فَتَنْفَعُ الذِّكْرَى Now he says, أَمَّا مَنِ اسْتَغْنَى As for the one who doesn't care, as for the one who's heedless, for the one that's carefree, for the one who thinks himself without need, you know, free of need, that's istighna. Istighna comes from the word istighna. And istighna comes from the word ghani. And ghani means rich. That's why you know what it means. And it also, if you're rich, you mean free of need. You don't need anyone. You depend on yourself. Self-dependent. Independent of others. And this is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-ghani. And Allah is al-ghani. Because he's free of all need. We need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now, He's referring in this ayah to who? To the ones that Rasulullah is speaking to. And istighna, Allah says, amma man istighna. He's referring to Quraysh, but He says istighna. This Hamzat al-Wasl and Seen at the beginning of this word, it implies something. It implies that this person thinks he's free of need. Thinks he is self-sufficient. What is he free and free of need? They think that they are free of need. They, that they are self-sufficient. They do not need the Wahi, the Quran. They don't need this recited to them. They don't need this guidance. And this is obviously we said it's referring to the prestige, to the elite of Quraysh. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was giving da'wah at that time. The ones that he was calling to Islam. And here, you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed them? Allah now, he's telling his messenger that alayhi salatu wasalam, this is their intention. You're speaking to them, they make it like they're listening, but their intention was istighna. They're really just listening and istighna, this alif sin, also implies that they don't really want to learn anything. They are only listening for one fact, and that is to open a debate with you, and open an argument and a discussion. Why do we say this? Because the, the Hamza, the Hamza al-Wasl and sin implies this. So it implies these two meanings. They think they are free of need, and also they think, or it implies, that they don't really, really their intention, they don't want to learn. They are only carefully listening so they can later on open a debate and a discussion with you. So Allah exposed them in this ayah. Just by saying, Amma man istighna. These people are istighna. These people have this arrogance within them. They don't want to learn. So on one hand you have Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about his intention which was he came to purify himself so he can free himself of, of sins and so he can clean himself, become a better person. And on the other hand, we have the elite of Quraysh we're being told what their intention was and that is that they are free of need, they don't need to listen to this Qur'an, they don't want to listen to it, rather they're only listening to debate Rasulullah in the future. So, what about this Amma man istighna? Because Allah says, Amma man istighna. As for the one who doesn't care, what about him? Allah says, فَأَنْتَ لَهُ فَأَنْتَ لَهُ Then it is you, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who has given them attention. It is you, فَأَنْتَ لَهُ And this tasadda, let me tell you something about this word tasadda. It comes from Sad Yun, Sad Dalya, which, some, which literally means to echo, something that echoes. Something that, you know, hits the wall and continues to bounce back, just like sound, you know? The sound will, it'll bounce off the wall and it'll continue to come back to your ear over and over. This is Sad Yun. So Tasadda would mean to go back to something over and over again just like the sound comes to your ear over and over again. So what the Messenger والسلام, is being told, you happen to go to these disbelievers of Quraysh 
over and over again. You keep going to them. And when this distraction came to you of Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum, you also went back to them. You looked at him and then you turned back to them. You keep doing this. فَأَنْتَ لَهُ تَصَدَّى Over and over, this is not like one instance. You keep trying to go to them. But this time the da'wah actually worked. But before you kept going to them. Now Allah is teaching him an important lesson. What's important to highlight is this word فَأَنْتَ لَهُ تَصَدَّى أَنْتَ It is you who turns back to them. To them. لَهُ What's important about this? What's being told? In other words, what we're understanding is that you keep turning towards them. You keep turning towards them and they keep turning away from you. And they keep turning away from you. And why is it that they don't turn to you? Why don't they turn back to you? Because they're free of need. They don't need you. That's why they don't turn to you. So now what's being taught, what's being taught here right now is a very important lesson. They don't need the message. So now it seems that they have the upper hand and you're the one that looks desperate. And now that's an insult to the message. Just imagine a businessman, a salesman, he wants to sell you a product. You're the customer. And you're not interested, then he is following you. Look, please, and then he come and tell you. And you know those people who walk around with flyers, and you're not interested, and you just keep walking away. Who's the one now here that that looks lesser in the sight of the other? Who? The salesman, the one that's selling. He's the one that looks desperate. You don't want to buy. So Allah Azza wa Jal is teaching His Messenger, don't do this again, because it looks like you're desperate. And the Quran and Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you, Ya Rasulullah, were in no need of these people. They're the ones that are in need of this da'wah. So he teaches him a profound lesson here. Don't turn back to them. You keep turning back. So now he teaches him, don't turn back. They want to listen. They want the message. They need it. They come to you now. No more. None of this. This comes later on when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kalla. إِنَّهَا تَذْكِرَةً She says, no, that's it, enough, no more. So this is what's important to know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like that His Messenger be perceived in such way. He wants His Messenger to have the upper hand. So He is encouraging His Messenger to focus on those that want the guidance. Focus on the companions. They're the ones that all, they're the ones that are in need. You have the upper hand on them. And if the elite of Quraysh have heard the message and they still reject it, then it's not necessary for you to make yourself look like the lower one by repeatedly going to them. Khalas, forget them, don't worry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need them. His messenger alayhi salam also does not need them. And Islam does not need them. So don't make yourself look desperate in wanting them to be guided if they have rejected the message and firmly chosen that as their path. فَأَنْتَ لَهُ تَصَدَّى You are giving them attention by going to them over and over. It seems that they have the upper hand. So now don't go there again. Islam does not need them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stops him from doing this again. Now, is there any problem? Would there be any sin on Rasulullah if he doesn't go? Allah tells him in the next verse, وَمَا عَلَيْكَ أَلَّا يَزَّكَّ وَمَا عَلَيْكَ أَلَّا يَزَّكَّ No, there isn't any sin, no harm whatsoever upon you. No blame upon you, no fallback on you that you will not, uh, that they will not purify themselves. If they don't purify themselves, well, well that's not a sin upon you. وَمَا عَلَيْكَ Two meanings. The first meaning is that there is no sin upon you that they don't want to purify themselves. And the other meaning is that it's not your responsibility. وَمَا عَلَيْكَ It's not your responsibility. It's not an obligation upon you that they purify themselves. It's their responsibility. It's upon them only to strive to purify themselves. 
So what is the what is the the purpose of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Again, this this all the Quran is connected. Go back to the surah that was before, Surah Al Nazi'at. What was the ending of it? Innama anta munziru man yakhsha. All you are, all you could do is remind who fears, who fears, man yakhsha ha, who fears that day. And Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, he fears. So he more, has more preference than Quraysh. So this is the, the, this is the uh, job of Rasulullah just to warn the others. So he has no responsibility. And if he doesn't follow them, then there's no sin upon him. That's all right. And uh, something else interesting we learn in this ayah. <coughs> so subhanAllah, this story, the story was a tafsir of that ayah. And now he's going to implement. He won't go to them anymore. And something interesting we find in this surah and in this ayah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed them again. The first time he exposed them, he said, Istagna. He said, oh, they actually, they look, they pretend that they're listening, but rather they are free of need. They don't even need this. They don't want to listen to it. They don't want to benefit from it. The other exposure Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives in this ayah is by the word وَمَا عَلَيْكَ أَلَّا أَلَّا This word Allah It exposes them well, How would you understand this? Let's understand opposite to it so you can understand this Something else that could have been mentioned here would have been وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ oh, Sorry وَمَا عَلَيْكَ إِلَّا يَزَّكَّ Could have been illa, But Allah said Allah What's the difference? See illa would have meant it is not a sin upon you وَمَا عَلَيْكَ if they don't purify themselves. Illa would have meant if. So in other words, there would have been a possibility that they wanted purification. But Allah says, Allah. You know what Allah means? It means there is no sin upon you that they will not purify themselves. So in other words, Allah became a statement of fact. Allah exposed them again. He said it's not a matter of if they want to purify themselves. These people will not purify themselves. They don't want to purify themselves. Why did we say this? Because Allah said Allah. He didn't say illa. See, this, this, this is an exposure. And Allah exposed them again by saying Allah yazakka. So in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling His Prophet that these people have no inclination whatsoever to purify themselves. No, no intention whatsoever. Allah yazakka. And, and subhanAllah, this comes also, link it to the surah before, in surah al-Nazi'at, we found the same with Fir'aun. Fir'aun, in surah al-Nazi'at, when, when Musa gave him the da'wah, when he told him, هَلَّكَ إِلَىٰ تَزَكَّ وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَتَخْشَى فَأَرَاهُ الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَى وَحَبِلْ كَذَّبَ وَعَصَى He denied. He denied. So also there, because, why? Because Fir'aun, he, he what? He tagha, right? إِنَّهُ tagha. And why does the insan, why is he, why is there tughyan in him? Why does he rebel? When he sees himself free of need. Doesn't Allah say this in Surah Al-Arab? He says, كَلَّا إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى that the insan he'll rebel. When? When he becomes free of need. When he sees himself in luxury and Allah has given him. And this becomes later on in Surah Al Fajr, we'll explain it there. You know, subhanAllah, it becomes later on we understand that the problem, you know, there Allah said, uh, he speaks about the nations that become corrupt. Then Allah tells us, no, it's not the nation that becomes corrupt. A nation doesn't become corrupt. Who becomes corrupt? The journey begins with you. You're the one that becomes corrupt. And as a result, nation will become corrupt when there's a few people that are corrupt. That's how corruption begins. So when we learn about Fir'aun, we learn Fir'aun, he became a taghi, he rebelled because of the istighna he had within him. The free of need. He didn't need anyone. So this is the same of Quraysh. Allah says, Amma man istagna. It's the same story. So in other words, we learn that both of them didn't want the tazkir. 
Both of them didn't want any purification. What was the core problem? The core problem wasn't that they rebelled. That was a result of something. And that something was that they had istighna, free of need. And they don't want any limits put to them. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to say. Free of need. I don't need your rules. I don't need your law. I don't need your book. I don't need nothing. I do what I want. So he kathaba wa asq. So that was the problem with Fir'aun, istighna, and it's the same problem with Quraysh, istighna. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says on the other hand, وَأَمَّا مَنْ جَاءَكَ يَسْعَى As for the one who came to you rushing, يَسْعَى And again, they'll pay attention to the word جَاءَكَ Again, we're, we're given the, the illustration, Allah is illustrating that Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum wasn't a casual, let's go benefit from Rasulullah today. Now he came seriously, he wanted to learn something. So with full, again, enthusiasm and rushing to the Messenger alayhi salatu was salam. وَأَمَّا مَنْ جَاءَكَ يَسْعَى يَسْعَى means to rush, right? It's a little faster than walking and it's slower than running. Just the sa'i between al-safa wa al-marwa. When you pace, pace walk between the sa'i, al-safa wa al-marwa, it's like a rushing walk. Quicker than walking, uh, it's uh, slower than running. Yes, sir. And this also, by, by reading this word, also connects us to the previous surah. In the previous surah, we learn about Fir'aun. What did he do? Thumma adbara yasa. Thumma adbara yasa. He also, when he saw the da'wah of Musa increasing, when he saw the, the magicians making sujood, when he was losing power, now he's sitting in his quarters, you can just imagine him, and he's pacing back and forth. What should I do? What should I do? What should I do? How can I get rid of his da'wah? What? So he paced forward. But his pacing was what? Was out of arrogance. Was out of arrogance. Was out of to prove himself ana rabbukum al-a'la. Was out of full corruption. Now Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum, his pacing was out of what? Allah tells us, wa huwa yakhsha. So look at the two opposites. One is pacing in the direction of kufr, the other is pacing in the direction of iman. There's an opposite in this in these two surah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa amma man as for the one who came rushing towards you, and that is Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum, wa huwa yakhsha. And he has khasha. Khasha means to fear someone that's greater than you. And what is it? Why is it important to say wahua? And he? Why is it important to have this this uh, preposition he he? Refer to him as he. You know, Allah could have said wa amma man wa He came rushing and he came and and there's there's khasha in him. Allah said wahua yaksha and he. You know what? Because when you understand huwa yaksha, he's the one that fears, not them. That's why it's important to mention wahua. Because when you say wahua, then what you're actually saying is that other than him doesn't have khasha in him. So the kuffar Quraysh, again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes them. He's saying he's the one that has khasha, not the ones you are talking to right now. They don't have khasha. That's why the word wahua comes. Subhanallah, just this wahua gave us this whole meaning. Of he's got the khashya, others don't have. So three, Allah exposed them in three places in this surah. Istaghna and Allah and wahua yakhsha, they don't have khashya. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَنْتَ لَهُ تَلَهَّا And it is you who is turning away from him. فَأَنْتَ لَهُ تَلَهَّا فَأَنْتَ sorry, عَنْهُ فَأَنْتَ عَنْهُ تَلَهَّا You're the one that's turning away from him. Talaha, let me just tell you something about talaha. It comes from the word lahu. Lam, ha, wo. A common translation of this is what? Well, entertainment. So lahu is entertainment. But what it actually means is to be busy, engaged with something that keeps you away from something more important. In other words, lahu is a distraction from something that's greater, something that's more important. So Allah is saying, فَأَنْتَ عَنْهُ تَلَهَا You are busy with someone else, rather he is more important to give him attention. 
So don't repeat this again. فَأَنْتَ لَهُ فَأَنْتَ عَنْهُ تَلَهَ So in this case, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, Allah, so in the case of Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, Allah is saying, you are engaged in an act which isn't as important as the blind companion Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. You are focusing on the disbelieving people whose hearts Allah has seen and they have no fear, no intention to purify themselves and who think they are independent of anyone else's guidance. So these people, there's no hope in them. So as a result now, do not ever again be talaha, be distracted from those that do want the guidance. Don't turn to them again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now says, Kalla innaha tadhkira. Kalla innaha tadhkira could be understood in the two senses as, No, not you. Oh, disbelievers of Quraysh, he doesn't need to waste his time with you. So the speech is directed to Quraysh. Kalla innaha tadhkira. Kalla would mean, No, enough, Quraysh. You know, he doesn't need to waste his time with you. And the other sense, it's understood that it's a speech to the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, that is, no, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they are not worthy spending time with them. You'd spend your time with one who fears, one who wants to purify himself. And another meaning of kalla is associated with haqqan. No doubt, Allah is saying kalla inna tafkira, no doubt, this, in this, Yani in this story, in this story that just happened, is a tafkira, is a powerful reminder, is a reminder for you and for others to come, meaning for us as well. We learn this. We learn all these lessons that we learn and share, how you don't pass judgments over others and so on. This is a tafkira for the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam and for everyone of his ummah that comes after him. Kalla. إِنَّهَا تَذْكِرَ And tadhkira is the hyperbolized version of the dhikra which also means this is the highest form of reminder. And this also, إِنَّهَا تَذْكِرَ refers to the story that these few verses that we share. Why, why does this become important to mention this? Because the ayah that comes after this, Allah says, فَمَنْ شَاءَ ذَكَرَهُ إِنَّهَا is feminine. Then he says, Dhakarahu is masculine. So what's the difference here? Actually, this Tadk innaha ayil qissa, this story, and a story in the Arabic language is a feminine, it's referred to as the feminine. Uh, so we say a feminine person, so we say, yeah, innaha. In this story, there's a tadkira. Now there's something very important to mention here. Also, because these ayat are within the Quran, so obviously also as well, at some stages, it could refer to the Quran itself in some sayings. So why does the Qur'an call itself a tadhkir? And we know that the Qur'an, 23 years when it was being revealed, many of the verses were new. Many ahkam were new coming down. But the Qur'an calls itself a reminder. Now if, if it's calling itself a reminder, a reminder means it's something mean you know, and we're just reminded. So if the Qur'an is something new that's being revealed, why is it calling itself a reminder? And we know a reminder is something me and you know. So what is the idea here? The concept is that all of us were born al fitra right? A predisposed human decency, a disposition of decency that we had within us, that Allah created us, created us with. That's recorded in Surah Al-A'raf, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took all the generations Every single person that lived from Adam up until the last man on this earth, Allah took them from Adam's back. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a great covenant between us and him. He said, Am I not your Lord? Am I not your master? What did we say? Yes, we bear witness to this. So we acknowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our master. Now, when we came into this world, we all forgot. We all forgot. No one can remember. Allah reminded us in the Quran. So now this story doesn't become a new story. It's a reminder. So every single ayah in the Quran counts as a reminder 
for that initial covenant we took. So you understand how the concept of reminder comes? Sah, the Quran is, is new when you come to listen to it. But actually in reality, that, that fitra is instilled in you. The Tawheed of Allah. And the whole Quran, the whole purpose of it is to prove the Tawheed of Allah. Because once you believe in Allah, then you follow everything in here. But you got to be reminded that Allah is your Lord. So the Quran is called a tafkira, reminding you of that day that you took the covenant with Allah. So now that is not a new thing, it's a reminder. So that's why it's called a reminder in this sense. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ شَاءَ ذَكَرَهُ Whoever wills, whoever wants. See again, giving the idea of don't go back to them and teach them. Rather, this Qur'an is whoever wills comes to it. doesn't go to you. You come to it. فَمَنْ شَاءَ Whoever wills. Whoever has this uh, wanting of becoming pure and cleaning himself. ذَكَرَهُ أَيْ ذَكَرَ الْقُرْآنِ ذَكَرَ مَا فِي الْقُرْآنِ Now the masculine, that's referring to the entire Qur'an. All of it. أَمَّا إِنَّهَا تَذْكِرَهُ is referring to part of it. فَمَنْ شَاءَ ذَكَرَهُ is referring to the entire Qur'an. So whoever wants to take remembrance from it, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, your duty is only to convey this message. And it is upon the people if they want to remember or benefit from this uh, message. So don't worry about who wants to and who doesn't want to. Your job is to just deliver this message and they will be responsible for it. They listen, it's up to them now. They follow, they don't follow. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to describe this Qur'an. He says, فِي صُحُفٍ مُكَرَّمَةٍ Now this is serious description Allah describes. And why does He describe this? To, they, they, we'll, we'll explain. He says, فِي صُحُفٍ مُكَرَّمَةٍ This Qur'an is in honored sheets. Suhuf. A suhuf in the Arabic language comes from the word sahifa, which is to spread out papers, to spread out scrolls, and to write on them. That's a suhuf, that's a sahifa. You know sahifa, the newspaper? You read it, you open it, you unfold it. That's a suhuf. Allah is saying that this Qur'an, فَمَنْ شَاءَ ذَكَرَهُ This hat, this pronoun is referring to the Qur'an. How do we describe this Qur'an? Allah says that this Qur'an is in suhuf in mukarrama it is, it's in scrolls, it's in sheets, it's in scriptures. That's where it is. And these scriptures, because it's got Qur'an on it, what did it become? Mukarrama. It became on it. We also learn that anything that Qur'an is written on becomes on it at the same time. So this book, this piece of paper is on it right now. Why? Because it has Allah's word on it. So Allah said to you, these words, this Qur'an is in sheets, and now Mukarrama. Now we describe these sheets as Mukarrama. Why? Because it has Allah's word on it. We learned how much you honor the Quran. Allah honored the Quran. So me and you should honor the Quran since Allah honored it. How does Allah honor it? What sheets is he talking about? At the time Rasulullah is reciting, there is no book. There is no Quran. Where is it? This is actually referring to Allah al Mahfuz. Look how honored it is. It's so honored that it's not even here, it's up there. That's where it was at that time. في صحف مكرمة Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says مرفوعة It's elevated. Now this became clear that it's, it's referring to Allah al-Mahfud. مرفوعة And now مطهرة It's purified. It's purified. Those that touch it are pure. Who's the one that touches it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us بأيدي سفر It's in the hands of Safara. We'll come to Safara, but just before this, why does Allah mention Mukarrama, Marfu'a, Mutahara? It's honored, it is elevated, and it is pure. This is describing the Quran, the Slawh al Mahfuz, in where the Quran is stored. The idea is because who's listening right now? The disbelievers are listening. You, disbelievers, think that this Quran just comes like this? You, the fact that you're just got to hear something of this? The fact that you're hearing the Qur'an, this is enough, this is a great, great enough for a human. This is too much. This, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored you. 
by allowing you to hear Quran. Otherwise, otherwise this word doesn't deserve to get to you because of its status and where it is. But Allah honored us and He gave us this word. So don't think that this message has to run after you. Don't have this idea. This, this is a stupid idea to have. You're supposed to come. It is a great of a fact and great enough that Allah just allowed you to hear it. This is the idea. This is why Allah is describing it now in this surah. So, before they would casually reject the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger would be desperate for them to accept it, now Allah is honoring his messenger and honoring the message while he's belittling, he's belittling those belittling those that what reject this message. He's making them now nothing right now. Because he's giving preference now and he's honoring his messenger and this message. And he says that this message is bi'aidi safara. It's carried out, it's carried by the hands of safara. Safara comes from the word safar. Seen fa ra which means al ilhar something that's exposed. In other words, the Qur'an is exposed. It's something that's not something that's covered. It's something that's open and it's exposed to everyone. Right? Fi raqtin manshur, Allah says. It's manshur, it's exposed. It's not closed. Manshur, nashar means he opened it up to everyone to see. That's the Qur'an. As opposed to people of other faiths, try to cover their book. Try to hide their book. You know? So much so that when, even this is the story of the companion, when they're reading the Bible, at Tawrat, at Tawrat at that time, uh, right at Injil, and then the Jews, they put their hands to cover Ayat al rajab the Ayah of, uh, of uh, whipping, the one that, uh, sorry? The stoning, sorry, the stoning of, uh, yani because in their scriptures, there was the Ayah of stoning, the one that commits fornication. So they covered it, they covered. So Allah says the Quran is not like this. It's exposed. في رق منشور بأيدي سفر السفر is something exposed. You know, or say إمرأة سافر means a woman is exposed. She's not covering herself. Exposed. So the idea is سفرة. This Quran is exposed. And بأيدي سفرة. These angels have nothing to hide. They take the message as it is from Allah. They don't hide anything from it. They deliver it as they took it. They expose it all to the Messenger عليه الصلاة والسلام. And Safara, a Safir. You know, Safir also comes from the same word, which means an ambassador. So Allah says, Bi'aydi Safara, it's in the hands of ambassadors, meaning the angels, because they're the ambassadors between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger, or the messengers, everyone that reveals the, uh, takes the revelation, alayhimu salatu was salam. And Safara also comes from the word Safar, which means Safar, the travel. And they're also travelers. They travel with the wahi from the sky to the earth. Travelers, right? So it's a very nice word that comes in, in, the, in the ayah. Gives us a lot, of, a lot of meaning. A lot of description about what the angels are. All these three descriptions of the angels, Wallahu alam could carry more, but that's for the very least what we've come to. Right? All in one word. It's the eloquence of the Qur'an, you know? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored the Qur'an so much so that he just didn't put it in the hands of anyone. He put it in the hands of angels. People that don't, the creation, that doesn't disobey Allah, that only obey Allah, that are involved in 24-7 of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's honored, He put it in their hands. Kiram in Barara. Now Kiram in Barara is describing these angels. Before, Mukarramah Marfu'a Mutahara is describing those scrolls in where the Qur'an is preserved and saved and stored. Now, Safara, Kiramin, Barara is describing the angels that take care of these scrolls. So Kiram means that they're noble. Noble, Kiram, noble. And I won't go into depth with it up until it comes in Surah Al-Infitar there, when Allah says Kiram and Katibin. That's where we explain it because it's got a, a larger discussion to it. But I will say just for the very least, Barara. Barara comes from the word Bar. Bar. Bar literally means to be righteous, to do good. And there is another word, Bar. Bar is less than Bar. So Bar is really, really good, extremely good person. And Bar 
someone that's bad is good, but not as good as bad. Now let me just give you the, the profound meaning in this. Uh, this bar, it has two ways you can make a plural of. You could either say abrar, you've all heard abrar, and that abrar and fi na'im. And you could make a plural of it and say barah. That's as it comes here. So what's the difference? Allah, this is the only place barah comes in the Quran, by the way. This is only the place. And in other places, it's only abrar. Just to understand this, we said abrar and barara, both are plurals, right? But barara, in the Arabic language, we say this is jama' kathra. For like I can say, it's a multiple plural, plural squared, an awesome plural, right? Double the plural. And abrar, this is what they say in the Arabic language as jama'u qilla. It's just a plural on its own. It's a less or a plural. While barara is a bigger, larger plural. Now, how do you understand this? Look at this. When Allah says, إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ Who's he referring to there? He's referring to from the people. al abrar Abrar can only be the people, us. Right? The believers. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from al abrar And barara is special for the angels. Why? Who can get the, the connection? Number. Ah, good. Barara, we said, is the awesome plural, the larger plural. And that deserves the angels because they're all good. All of them are good. However, when it comes to the humans, the lesser plural was used because not all the humans are good. There are some good, there are some bad. So it says, Al Abrar. And it's a very interesting word, this Abrar. It comes from Bar as well. Bar means land. Opposite to Bahr, you have Bahr and Bar. So when Allah refers to the believers, He says Abrar, the word Abrar comes from land. Which one's more stable, land or ocean? Land. So basically, when, when the word Abrar comes, we're given the idea that these people are stable. They're firm in their Iman. Just like the land is firm. You can see, SubhanAllah, it comes from the same root word, Bar, Bar, which means yani, land. And that's stable. And Allah called them Abrar because they're stable. And they're strong in their iman. And so inshallah ta'ala, uh, we'll conclude here because now uh, the passage changes. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the upper hand to the message, all these ayat, the purpose of it was to bring the upper hand back for the message. This message is mukarrama marfu'a mutahara. It's bi'aydi safara kiramin barara. Now the message got its upper hand. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now addresses the man. قُتِلَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا أَكْفَرَةً So many profound lessons we're going to learn inshaAllah ta'ala. Perhaps we'll finish uh, this uh, surah in the next uh, session. It's very important. Yani, attend. This is very important discussion in the next uh, half of the surah. It becomes really important in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now empowers the human being. He empowers it. After he, he elevated the status of the message, now he there's a direct attack on the human being. Qutil al insan. You know? Qutil. May the human be cursed. You know? As well, Qutil al insan. Killed. You know, the human has been killed. Ma'ak farah. How ungrateful he is. But it's just talking about the Quran. It allowed you to hear the Quran. You better be grateful just for this. You know, some ayat we read, they're sajda, we're supposed to make sajda. Be grateful for what Allah has given you. How dare you now? Allah now directly attacks. How ungrateful. The first thing he's ungrateful to was this Quran that I have given him. You know, and so on, and the ayat will go. And then he just keeps dropping, dropping, dropping. What, what have you been created from? You weren't able to even bring yourself out. You look at your food, stare at your food. This water, you couldn't even live without it. And so on, it just belittles you, becomes very small. Towards the end, you should have an appreciation of Allah Azza wa Jal. Become grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll also explain the connection of the beginning of the surah and of the ending of the surah. And I'll give you that as probably a thought for yourself. And you try to, next time when we want to come, I'm going to ask you the question. 
I'll give you some time to think of the beginning of the surah and how does it connect to the end of the surah. You probably have now a bit of experience since we've done that with Surah Al-Naba and Surah Al-Nazi'at. Now I'll give you the opportunity, just to, I'm telling you now so you can have the time for it. Go home, look at the beginning of the surah and the end of the surah. And don't worry about Google, you won't find it on Google because it's all in Arabic. And come inshallah ta'ala and let's share some ideas. This work, this mind of yours. Let's see who can come with a connection of the beginning of the surah of the ending of surah. Right? It's not, it's not that clear. You need to focus on what we spoke about. You need to have focused and had attention so you can connect. And so bit by bit as, as we go on, I'll, I'll try to give you the, uh, the role and the job of connecting the surah for us and connecting the beginning of the surah and the ending of the surah. It's a lot of fun in the Quran. I actually enjoyed it so much. And I like you to have the same experience, the same, the same enjoyment. Uh, really, it is a field on itself that's amazing, that's mesmerizing in the Quran. Really, you'll be blown out of where you are when you see how every surah connect. Let me just share with you one more and finalize with this. Look at Surah Al-A'raf. For example, Surah Al-A'raf, we find at the end of it, there's a sajda. That's the first surah that has a sajda, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, Those that are with Allah, they are not arrogant towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship. They worship Him. They're humble in the worship. And they praise Him. They exalt Him. And for Him, only they make sujood, prostration. And so now we're ordered to make sujood. Look at the beginning of the surah. It speaks about Iblis and how he refused to make sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The beginning of the surah gives us the story of Adam and Iblis. Uh, uh, you know, astakbar. Did you become from those that are arrogant? And 24 pages later, Allah says, Those that are with Allah, they're not arrogant and they make sujood. And that's probably one of the toughest ayat in the Quran in which you're probably extra motivated to make sujood when you understand. So, Allah, some would say Allah is sujood sunnah, sunnah. But this sujood, this sajda specifically becomes so much more of an important sajda when you understand the beginning of the surah and the ending of the surah. You make sajda in the intention of Iblis didn't make, well I better make. Otherwise what is the difference between me and him? Right? Although we're not talking about the fuqah principle of it. It remains a sunnah, we're not changing that, that hukam. But I'm saying it becomes more of an important one when you understand this. When you're understanding the beginning of it, spoke about someone that refused to make sajda, and then at the end Allah gives you an opportunity to make sajda. So make the most of it and make that sajda. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people of the Qur'an, people who benefit from the reminders of the Qur'an.